Well, good morning, New Life Midtown. If I could invite you all to stand up this morning, welcome to the house of the Lord. Guys, we have a special treat this morning as Pastor Jonathan Swindle and Pastor Jade, we've had the opportunity to send them both out to different countries on mission trips. And so with us today, we have a special guest, Aaron Keyes. Aaron has been leading worship now for over 20 years. He's the founder of the 10,000 Fathers and Mothers Worship School. And guys, it's just such a delight to be a part of a family that is greater than just us here, where we have people that can come in in the body of Christ and join us and partner with us in worship. And so the way that we like to start our services is by reading scripture together. So if I could invite you to read this scripture from Psalms 104. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works. He who looks at the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord all my life. I will sing praise to my God as long as I live. Let's pray. Jesus, thank you so much for your goodness. Holy Spirit, thank you so much that you have invited us here. You have drawn us together, Lord, into your presence. God, I pray that you would shape us today. God, I pray that as we participate in worship and giving in the message, God, in the preaching of the word, Lord, that you would transform our hearts, that you would call us into yourself. And Lord, we magnify your name. We bless you, Lord, and we worship you in Jesus' name.
this morning. It's Pentecost Sunday. It's the birthday of the church. Happy birthday, Church of Jesus. It's a good day today. We're celebrating. We're celebrating what the Holy Spirit has done for the last, well, a couple thousand years in the history of the church, at least, but even before that, how the Holy Spirit is the giver of life. The Holy Spirit is the one who leads us and draws us. That's what we just sang about. We depend on the Holy Spirit. And there's a verse in Isaiah 33, that I absolutely love to think about on Pentecost. And it's a little, um, it's a little arcane, a little, a little odd, but let me just give it to you and then we'll, we'll talk about it. We'll keep singing, okay? Isaiah 33 in verse 20, it says, look upon Zion, the city of our festivals. Your eyes are gonna see Jerusalem and you're gonna see a tent that will not be moved. Then it says, there the Lord will be our mighty one. And it says, it will be a place of rivers and wide canals. Interesting. It's like, look on Jerusalem. You're going to see the Lord as a river and a wide canal. And then it says, no boat with oars will ride them. and No mighty ship will sail them. The Lord is our judge. The Lord is a lawgiver. It's an interesting thing. It says, look upon Zion. You're going to see the Lord as a river and a wide canal, but it's not the kind of river that you row yourself into. No oars allowed. It's not the kind of river where a motorboat or an engine is going to get you where you need to go. The only way you're going to get there is through the wind, through breath, through the power of the wind. And then it goes on and it says, look, your problem is, let me read it to you. He goes, your rigging hangs loose. Your mast is not held secure. The sail is not spread. He's like, the only way to move into this river is by being ready your sails. And this morning on Pentecost Sunday, we recognize it's not by might, it's not by power, it's not by rowing, it's not by strategy, it's not by marketing, it's only by the Spirit of God that we're going to see what we're all so hungry to see. That's why we're going to be singing these songs this morning. You're the way, you're the truth, you're the life, you're the one. As your Spirit leads, you're the only hope that we have, that we would follow you, that we would receive what you have for us. And so even this morning, we do what we can to open up our hearts, to open up our sails for the wind of God to blow, for the breath of God to come, for the spirit of God to move. Does that sound okay? Yeah. I mean, of all Sundays, on Pentecost Sunday, let's welcome the Holy Spirit. Let's say, Spirit of God, fall upon us.
simply ask you to come, ask you to move, ask you to fall. We also praise you for the ways that you have moved, the ways that you have come, the many times that you have fallen. We give you glory, Holy Spirit. Glory to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, as it is now, as it will be forever, world without end. Glory to you, Holy Spirit. We welcome you. You guys can have a seat. We're going to actually do one more song. And we've done it once here before, but it's been a while, so you might not remember it. But it comes from Psalm 127, where Solomon, I love this, there's these weird authors in the Psalms every now and then. So Solomon wrote a song, did you know that? Psalm 127. And he starts out and he says, Unless the Lord builds the house, we labor in vain. I like that. Solomon knew what it was like to build a big old house. And he looks back on his life and goes, the Lord doesn't build it, we're laboring in vain. And it just reminds me of this day of Pentecost, like how much we are absolutely reliant and dependent on the Holy Spirit to move. And it kind of connects to me to what Moses said in Psalm 90. So Moses also wrote a psalm. And in Psalm 90, he starts and says, Lord, you've been our dwelling place for generations, all this stuff. And at the end of it, he says a couple lines. He says this. He says, all of our days pass away. We finish our years with a groan. Teach us to number our days. that We may gain a heart of wisdom. And then he prays at the end of his psalm, let the favor of the Lord rest upon us and establish the work of our hands. And then he says, yes, establish the work of our hands. I love that. In Hebrew, there, there wasn't like, you know, asterisks <laughs> or you couldn't bold something. And so they would repeat it. Establish the work of our hands. Yes, establish the work of our hands. And I love this as a prayer for us going into Pentecost Sunday. We would say, Lord, if you don't build, we're just kind of spinning our wheels. If you don't fill us, what are we doing? Right? We're just constantly leaking and constantly empty. But if you would fill us. And the work of our hands, not just the worship of our Sundays, but the work of our hands, everything that we do, we would recognize the Holy Spirit is working in all of it. We're going to hear about that this morning with Jason. And that's our prayer. It goes like this. If you don't build it, then we labor in vain. Without your spirit, we stand with no strength. Oh, I know my time is passing away, and that the works 
you but I got energy this morning it's Pentecost so man it's time to praise the Lord hallelujah um, today I have the opportunity to encourage us in our giving and I want to point out and you guys really don't need it to be pointed out but who here has noticed gas prices lately <laughs> anyone anyone when you see it like each day go up another 15 cents like feel your heart go like Ooh, like why didn't I fill up yesterday because it's 15 cents more today. There's so many things like this happening, right? Like gas prices are going up and prices just everywhere are going up and it's easy to feel our souls kind of like Ugh, cringe, you know? It's kind of reveals something about our hearts every single day. And you know, the reason why we come together and we worship every Sunday is because it's a transforming work of Christ. It is being worked in us continually. We are continually being formed into the image of Christ. 
And you know, when we give in seasons where we feel like in our flesh, in our soul, that we want to hold back, we are declaring and we are, we are agreeing with the Holy Spirit that we are in a different kingdom now, right? We have a provider. That is the King Jesus. Money is not our king. Jesus is our king. And man, guys, isn't it good to be in the kingdom of God? Because in the midst of when everyone's holding back, we can continue to be a generous people. Man, it's cool. It's cool to be a Christian, y'all. We get to be a generous people everywhere we go, not just here in church, but out in the workplace. We get to be generous with ourselves. We get to be generous with our resources. Guys, in every area, because God's got us. Come on. Are you worried today? You know, the Lord says, do not be anxious about anything. And you know, he says that as a command. That means by the spirit of God, you are able to be completely at peace in every situation. So you'll see on the screen, we have four ways to give today. And guys, as you give, we're declaring, we're declaring that we live in a different kingdom, the kingdom of light, the kingdom of of blessing, the favor of the Lord rests on every single one of you. Amen. Come on. All right, we're going to transition into the prayers of the people now. So I would like to um, invite Hannah Stebbins up to this stage. And guys, let's partner our, our hearts with her as she prays. Lord, your people this morning declare, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. Father, we know that with each passing day that we are one step closer to the glorious return of Jesus. We wait in eager anticipation of the day that we of that day, and we simultaneously grieve those who have not yet come to know you. Stir up our hearts as we see the day approaching. May we be found awake and alert at your return. We pray for Team Romania and Team Costa Rica who are currently proclaiming your name. Would you pour out fresh revelation of your gospel into their hearts in such a way that it flows through them like like rivers of living water and that life would begin to bloom in the hearts around them. I pray that they would be strengthened spirit, mind, and body and that they would experience the fullness of joy as they are united in one heart and one mind to see your kingdom come here on earth as it is in heaven. Lord, hear our prayer. If you have your kids, draw them close to you now. We're going to send them out to kids' church together. We're going to pray over them the Lord's Prayer. So let's pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who have sinned against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever, amen. And in the words of Sidron Smith, kids, you may skip to your classes. (laughs) Oh, those are good skips, I love it. Well, guys, welcome. Happy Pentecost Sunday. Oh, come on. If you are with us here for the first time, we just want to welcome you here to New Life Midtown. Uh, Our pastor, Pastor Jay Duncan, and his whole family is actually out of town today. They are in Costa Rica on a missions trip sent out with the youth group from our church. It's going to be a powerful time, but we're so glad that you're here. We have a really special treat for you today. But before we get to the message... We're going to go into the extrovert's favorite time of service, which is connection time. Three minutes. So we're going to put three minutes on the clock, guys. Hug someone next to you.
All right. If you guys could start making your way to your seats, that would be delightful. Can I just say, it's just so good to see you all. You know, sometimes I get like nervous coming on stage and as soon as I get up here and I see your faces, I'm like, oh, this is my family. And I really love you guys. So man, thanks for being here today. It's just such a joy to be able to see you week after week. Well, we have a few, couple announcements today. Uh, most importantly, between services, there are donut holes for all of us. So please hang out a little bit, mingle with the 11 AMers. They got to sleep in, so they're gonna probably have a ton of energy. Um, and yeah, guys, donuts between service, hallelujah. hallelujah. And then if you are new with us, there is a QR code in the seat pocket in front of you. And if you wanna scan that code, we would just love to connect with you, to reach out and just, just get to know you and let you know who we are and let you know kind of the events and stuff coming up here at New Life Midtown. So if you are new, feel free to scan that QR code. If you are not a QR code person, go ahead and fill it out and you can bring it up to the Welcome Center between services. Well, guys, that's it. That's all my announcements. Pretty crazy. Today, we have a very, very special honor of having Pastor Jason Jackson from New Life downtown here with us. He is stepping in and filling in for us as Pastor Jade is out on a missions trip. And guys, I know you're going to be blessed. So let's give him a huge warm welcome to Pastor Jason Jackson. See, they, they turn it on for me at downtown because they don't trust me to do these kinds of, <laughs> kinds of things. Jade is clearly more talented than I am because he can handle doing two things at once. I can't walk and turn things on without falling. Guys, it's great to be here with you. Good morning. Uh, Lauren, I feel the same way. I always feel nervous like coming up to speak. And I feel exceptionally nervous whenever I travel to other places other than like my home congregation to preach. But I don't feel that way here. Uh, like within the New Life family, it's like, oh, I don't feel like I'm guest preaching somewhere. I feel like I get to go and be with another part of the family. And so it's great to be here. Great to be with you all. And I want to just once again say thank you. Uh, I know some of you have been around um, New Life Midtown for a long time before it was New Life Midtown, Antioch, and I learned two other names beforehand as well. So Freedom and Springs Harvest, is that right? Kind of the whole journey. Uh, and I just want to thank you for all the gifts that you have brought to New Life Church, uh, the strength that you have brought to our family of churches. Uh, you and your staff are such a gift to all of us. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Uh, we began a series back in January, I think now, uh, walking through a series called Who is God? And spending time talking about the one God who exists eternally in three persons, the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. So we spent kind of January, February, March, somewhere in there talking about the Father, and then spent Lent and Easter talking about Jesus the Son. And now we've been in this series talking about the Holy Spirit, which of course is perfect for Pentecost Sunday, uh, to be gathered together and to still be talking about the Spirit of God as we remember the Spirit being poured out on those early followers of Jesus as they're huddled together in that upper room and all that broke out of that space. As they tumbled out of the room, people were like, what is going on? And then Peter stands up and proclaims the good news about Jesus. And then we have all these people, 3,000 people being added to their number that day and the church being born. And now here we are, uh, all these years later, uh, connected all the way back to that great pouring out of the Spirit and continue to find the Spirit being poured out on us. Today, we're going to talk specifically about one of the ways the Spirit is poured out on us. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit and our creative vocation as the people of God. So we're going to begin in Genesis chapter 1, and here it goes. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, and now the earth was formless, and it was empty, and darkness was over the surface of the deep, but the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. When God goes about creating the entire cosmos, everything that we know, we read in the scriptures that it was formless, that it was empty, that it was dark. In other words, it was like an Iowa winter, uh, just nothingness. <laughs> for, I'm from there, so I can say that. Uh, but just dark and cold and empty and lifeless. But the Holy Spirit was present, hovering over it all, 
throughout this series, one of my great hopes for us has been that we've seen how the Trinity works together. That whatever the Trinity does, the Trinity does together. That the actions of the Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, are actually inseparable from one another. That the, the God the Father and God the Son and God the Spirit are always acting within each other's actions. That they're always present and always at work together. And we see that in creation. That all three are present and active in the very work of creation. One of the early church fathers, St. Basil, said it this way in his work on the Holy Spirit. He says, the Father brings everything into being through the Son and brings them to perfection through the Spirit. I love that. The Father brings everything into being through the Son and brings everything to perfection through the Spirit. However we imagine that work, I love his imagination there of thinking, but however we imagine the Father and the Son working together, we can say definitively the Spirit is active in the creation of the world. We can even say with other people that have said this for a long time that the Holy Spirit is the creator spirit. That the Holy Spirit is the creator spirit. He is the one who goes about the work of creation, not by himself, but he is present and active in creation. He is the creator spirit. What unfolds over the next six days in Genesis is just breathtaking. That that which is formless becomes defined. That that which was empty gets filled up. That everything that was chaotic becomes ordered. That that which was only darkness becomes light. That everything that was uninhabitable becomes inhabitable. That that which was lifeless becomes alive. What we see the Spirit doing is transforming nothing into something. And not just anything, but something that is full of beauty and life, something that we look at and declare is good along with the Father. When God finishes, of course, all of his initial creative work, that first week we learn that he does all of his work in six days, and then he rests. He rests. And he sort of sits above it all. What happens for us, though, oftentimes when we think about that moment, is when we think about God resting on the seventh day, we tend to think that what is happening in that space is that the original creation, that all that God has made is sort of a static perfection. And that God places humans in this in order to simply not mess it up. That creation is sort of a static perfection and humans are placed there simply not to mess it up. I think the image that comes to my mind is, have you ever had that moment maybe when you were a kid and your parents gave you that present that you were always waiting for, maybe for something for Christmas or for your birthday, and they give it to you, and you unwrap it, and you're looking at it, and then they tell you, okay, but now just don't open it. Like, leave it in the box. Because if you take it out of the box, then you might break it. If you take it out of the box, then it'll decrease in value. This was the conversation with my dad a lot. We were, like, into collectibles. And so I collected baseball cards as a kid, so we get this new box of cards, and then my dad would immediately go into a thing. He's like, I don't think you should open it. Because it'll be worth more someday if you just don't open it. Like, just leave it in the box and stare at it. And then, you know, someday it'll be worth a lot more money. I was collecting baseball cards in the 80s. They weren't worth anything. <laughs> but we tend to think about creation that way. It's sort of a static perfection. We just leave it alone. But the image that we get in the scripture is that creation is not a collectible. We're not simply meant to preserve it. God doesn't present us with a static creation and give us a passive vocation. Something else is actually going on in these opening chapters. Read this, Genesis chapter 1, verse 28. It says, God blessed people. He God blessed man and woman. He God blessed them. And he said this. He said, be fruitful and multiply or be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and what? Subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves on the ground. Genesis 2 puts it this way. Then the Lord God took man and he put him in the garden of Eden to do what? To work it and to take care of it. 
the commands to be fruitful and multiply, those commands are also given to birds and to fish and to animals. Those commands are not unique to us as humans. They're not unique to the people who are made in the image of God. But there's four other commands. Subdue, rule, work, take care of. The language of the original language that means to guard or protect. Those are unique to us. Those are unique to the image bearers. Those are the unique calls upon us as humans. But those verbs, if we really think about it, suggest that creation is actually a bit wild. That the created order, that what God makes is a bit wild. That Eden is a bit more wild than an English tea garden. <laughs> right? We tend to sort of think maybe, oh, it's just this static perfection. Don't mess it up. But creation needs cultivation. It needs care. It needs protection. It needs work. And all of that was true before the fall. All of that was true before our rebellion against God and his ways. Terence Fretheim, a Lutheran scholar, says it this way. He says, from God's perspective, the world needs work. Development and change are what God intends for it. And God enlists human beings to that end. From another angle, we can say this, my favorite part of this quote. God did not exhaust the divine creativity in the first week of the world. He didn't exhaust divine creativity in the first week of the world. Instead, God continues to create, and he uses creatures in a vocation that involves the becoming of creation. He enlists us. He calls us. He invites us into a vocation of continuing the creative work of God. The creative work of God continues through us with and by the Holy Spirit. We were actually created to co-create with the Spirit. But this is what we were created for. We were created to co-create, to partner with God in the ongoing creative work in the world. Tolkien describes humans this way. He calls us sub-creators or little makers or some of the language that Tolkien uses to describe humans. And he says that even when we are going about doing these things, when we are subcreating, when we are going about our little making, it's in these places that we emulate the true creator. It's actually one of the ways that we bear witness to God in the world. It's one of the ways that we carry the divine image is by going about a creative vocation. And this isn't just for creatives. We sometimes think of this and like, oh yeah, that's for the artists in the world. And I know there's several of you around here, like looking around the world room, we've got photographers and we have dancers and we have singers and we have writers. You have so many creative people in the context of this congregation who are a gift to, our, to this church and to the community, musicians and others. Sometimes we can think, oh, the creative work, that's done by all of those creative people, but I'm not one of them. What they do is beautiful and it's wonderful and it is a gift to us all. But as the people of God, we're actually called, all of us, to co-create with the Spirit in all of our work, both our paid and our unpaid work, <laughs> right? In our jobs or our careers, our vocations, and in our volunteer service, and actually all those little things that we have to do as a part of taking care of homes and yards and all of the other things that have been entrusted to us. That what we are meant to do as the people of God is to take what started in Genesis and continue it. That we're supposed to be looking around our world and identifying the places in our homes, in our lives, in our neighborhoods, in our churches, in our communities, and saying what around us is formless? What around us is dysfunctional? And how can we bring about definition and function? We're supposed to look around us and try to find the places that are empty or void and say, what needs to be filled up here? And how can we partner with the Spirit in filling this up? We're supposed to look around at things that are chaotic and confusing and say, how do we as the people of God bring order and peace and clarity to our world? We're supposed to look around and find the places that are dark and cold and be people that bring light and warmth and truth into those places. To look around and say, life is not, an un it's not habitable there to find the places that are uninhabitable or maybe the places where life is unsustainable or the places that life is unsafe and we're to be the people that come in and say, how do we help life flourish here for those who inhabit this space? To look around the places where we find nothing 
Or maybe we find evil and say, how do we partner with God to bring about good here? To find places that are lifeless and say, how do we bring these back alive again? This is what we're called to do in all of our paid and unpaid work. That the very heart of all of the things that we do is an, is an embodiment of this call. So whether you work in justice or you work in healthcare or you work in education or you work in a nonprofit or you work in food service or you work in administration or you work in finance or you work in manufacturing or you work by gardening or cleaning or laundry or lawn care, whatever it is in that spectrum, all of those things have places here where like this is where we can go about co-creating with God in little ways. Whenever we do this, even in the smallest ways, even in the hidden ways, even the ways that maybe are only seen to us and only appreciated by us, because certainly our kids never say thank you. <laughs> but in all of those places, what we are doing is we are co-creating with the spirits. And we are living out our creative vocation in the world. And this happens only with the spirits. We do not create on our own. We create with the Spirit. We see a beautiful example of this, Exodus chapter 35, around the construction of the tabernacle. Here, the people of God have been rescued out of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. They've been brought to Mount Sinai. God has made covenant with them. And he says, I want to be your God, and I want you to be my people, and I want to make my home with you once again, similar to the way that I made my home with you in Eden. He says, so I need you to build me a house. And this is what we read in Exodus chapter 35. And then Moses said to the Israelites, See, the Lord has called by name Bezalel, son of Uri, son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. And he has filled him with divine spirit. In the original language, it says he has filled him with the spirit of God. This guy has been called by name and filled with the spirit of God. With what? With skill and with intelligence and knowledge. It, well, in, in what? in every kind of craft, to devise artistic designs, architects pay attention, to work in gold and silver and bronze, in cutting stones for setting and in carving wood and in every kind of craft. And he has inspired him to teach both him and Aholiab, son of Ahashimach, son, uh, son of the tribe of Dan. And he has filled them with skill to do every kind of work done by an artisan or by a designer, by an embroiderer in blue, purple, and crimson yarns. I'm not sure whose school colors they are, uh, whether you there's like the, the tabernacle is your home. And in fine linen or by a weaver or by any sort of artisan or skilled designer. Exodus says that God filled these people with the spirit of God to do this kind of work. So what happens for us so many times when we think about the spirit-filled life, when we think about being filled with the spirit, we immediately go to the places we normally go to. We immediately go to the spiritual gifts. We immediately go to things like speaking in tongues. Or we go to something like worship and the encounter that we have with the spirit and being filled up. Or we go to ministry sort of context of saying, well, you know, like pastors and staff, like those people are filled with the spirit of God so they can go about the work of the ministry. And we sort of, you know, sort of think about all of those things as being, this is what the spirit fills us for. My guess is most of us don't think about our work, about our jobs, about what it is that we do Monday through Friday, nine to five, or what we do in the afternoon or on the weekends, the things that we put our hands to. But here in Exodus chapter 35, there's some jobs to do around design and construction. There's a job to do, and the Father calls and the Spirit fills for that kind of labor as well. The Spirit fills with skill, with intelligence, with knowledge needed to do the work. The Spirit shows them what to do and how to do it and gives them the ability to do it. It's the Spirit that lets them know what is needed. It's the spirit that gives them insight into tackling any problems that are going to arise. It's the spirit who has given them their experience and then maximizes their experience for the effort that is needed along the way. We sometimes think this is the work of the spirit and this is just the stuff that I have to do because I live in a fallen world. But the spirit doesn't work that way. He doesn't parse up our lives the way that we do. 
the same spirit that wants to fill us with spiritual gifts and all of those kinds of things for life in community is the same spirit that fills us to co-create with the Lord in the work of our hands in our day-to-day sort of lives. The spirit is the one who actually enables our abilities. The spirit enables our abilities. Can you stop for a moment and think about what is it you have? What are you good at? What do you bring? What are the skills? What are the gifts? What are the experiences? What are the talents? What are the things that you have? What are the things that if someone said, you know what? I know just the right person for that job. I know just the right person for that task. I know somebody who can help you. What conversation does your name come up in? Have you seen that as a gift? Have you seen that as one of the unique ways that the Spirit of God has actually filled you for co-creative work in the world? That he is actually, that's not just something that you're good at. It's not just something that you're like learned how to do, but maybe it's actually a gift that the Spirit has imparted to you. It's a way in which the Spirit has filled you. Or maybe you find yourself in a situation where you're experiencing some kind of lack. And you think about your either paid or unpaid work. What do you need? Maybe you've got a problem that you're just like, I just don't know the way through this. I don't know what to do about this situation. Maybe you're facing something. You're like, I, I just really feel like I don't have what I need. Have you thought about asking the Spirit? Have you thought about bringing that to the Lord in prayer? Because the same God that's concerned about all of the spiritual gifts kinds of things is also concerned about your work in the workplace and everywhere else that you're dealing with. Have you asked? Maybe you find yourself in a, in a situation now in life where your abilities have changed. You've had an accident. Or maybe you're facing a disease. Or maybe just the process of aging. And the abilities that you had in your 20s are not the same abilities that you have in your 80s. Not able to do the same things in the same way. Or maybe you're in a situation where your opportunities seem to have changed, either through job loss or through retirement or something along those lines. I want to encourage you today that the Spirit is still filling you. And the Spirit is still enabling you. Maybe it's different than it was before, but it still matters. It still matters that what you do still matters. And how you do it still matters. In your paid and your unpaid work, it still matters. And the Spirit is still the one who is enabling you. Maybe this morning you're sitting here thinking like, I just, I gotta be honest, Jason, I just don't see my work that way. I just don't see my work as something the Spirit is concerned about. I just see it as a job that I do, chores that have been assigned to me, a to-do list that has to get plowed through. Exodus 36 says this, it says, Moses then called Bezalel and Aholiab and every skillful one to whom the Lord had given skill and everyone whose heart was stirred to come to do the work. Everyone whose heart was stirred to come to find yourself in that place of saying, I just don't see it that way. My prayer for you is that you would find that the Spirit would begin to stir your heart, begin to stir you in a different way, for it's the Spirit that actually stirs our passions. Those desires that we have, those interests that we have, the things that we care about, the things that we're concerned about, those passions that we have in life, it's the Spirit that stirs those as well. It's interesting in this passage at the very beginning, it says the Lord called these people, and here it says Moses called them. Interesting. The Lord called them, and then Moses called them. The Lord is actually always calling us into co-creative vocation with him, but oftentimes that call comes through other people. It oftentimes comes to us through other people. I just want to encourage you, if you're like, I just don't see my life that way, to stop and think for a minute, what have you heard the Lord say about you and about your talents and your gifts and your passions and what it is that you bring? Or what is it maybe you've heard the Lord say through other people? I remember as a, as a, a young kid and my family would occasionally go to church and 
when we were at church, there would always be some program that the Sunday school was doing or there would be programs at school. I don't know what it is about adults, but they always think it's just a really good idea to get a bunch of kids in front of people singing songs. <laughs> we just think this is the greatest thing ever. Um, and then they end up with a kid like me uh, who can't sing on tune for anything. And so inevitably what would happen in every single one of these programs or at school at church is that the organizer, the teacher would come up to me and like, hey, Jason, we're going to do this thing. And we need someone to introduce the piece. Or we need someone to read this scripture in the middle of it. Or we want someone to explain like where this song comes from. And we thought you would be the perfect person <laughs> to do that. You can say this part and then you can sit down over here and watch your classmates sing I think that was the Lord calling me through other people into public speaking. It was maybe not the kindest way <laughs> that I heard the Lord speak. But what is he saying to you? What is he saying to you through other people? What, is, what do you care about? What are you good at? What are the things that have arisen? Do you see those the way that the Lord is stirring your hearts? Everyone who has skills, it says. And everyone who the Lord gave skills. Well, which one is it? If they have skills, did the Lord give them skill? Uh huh. <laughs> yes. What skills has the Lord given you? What skills are you honing? How are you using them for His gifts, for His glory, for the good of others? When I was in high school, my brothers, I have two older brothers, and they spent most of their sort of high school career in vocational tech classes that every time that they had, uh, you know, sort of uh, an elective that they could use or a free period, they were heading down to what we called the shop area and they were doing woodworking and metalworking and small engine repair and all of these kinds of things. Like our whole school had this huge area of training people to do this. And so when it came time for me to have my first elective uh, in, it was like, oh, you know what? I should do woodworking too. That's what my brothers did. So I should go and do woodworking as well. So I go down to my first woodworking class and I'm sitting there and then the, the teacher starts talking about all the things that we're going to do and all the tools that we're going to use. And I'm looking around and everybody knows what he's talking about. And I'm, like, I'm so lost right now. And he just keeps talking and I'm getting more and more lost and more and more confused and everyone else feels right at home. This is the first time this has ever happened to me in a classroom setting. And I was like, I can't do this. I deal with a bit of perfectionism uh, a lot. And um, I thought, if I take this class, I'm going to lose my four point. <laughs> so I went and took a biomedical chemistry elective instead. It's <laughs> like an independent study. I was like, I just can't do this. I can't do this. I want I want to be a doctor, not a woodworker. So I'm going to go and do that as well. I don't have those skills. I don't have those passions. My wife wishes I would have stayed in that class, um, but I didn't. I went and took something else instead. But what are those skills? Maybe it's a way that God is showing you how he wants to co-create with you in the world. It says everyone in that passage, everyone whose heart was stirred to come and do the work. The original language says, all who the Lord lifted their heart. What lifts your heart? stirs your heart? What lifts in such a way that when you see something, you're like, I care about that. I concern, I'm, I'm concerned about that. I want to be a part of that. As I said a second ago, I always wanted to be a doctor. Actually, I wanted to be a pitcher for the Minnesota Twins. But <laughs> my fastball caps off like 60 miles an hour, so I didn't, didn't think that was going to be, be possible. Uh, so I always wanted to be a doctor. And then uh, after I came to the Lord at the end of my sophomore year in high school, uh, between my junior and senior year, something shifted inside of me. I got a chance to go away on this uh, really cool uh, medical opportunity and visit medical schools and sit in on surgeries and have all these conversations about medical ethics and medical schools. It was amazing. Uh, but during the course of that time, the most fun that I had was talking to other teenagers about Jesus. That's what lifted my heart more than and so I came back, and, I, and my mom's like, so how was it? I said, Mom, it was amazing. She's like, so you're going to be a doctor then? I was like, no, I think I'm going to be a pastor. <laughs> <laughs> she still hasn't picked her jaw up off the floor yet. She's like, I, I 
just don't understand. <laughs> it's like maybe you can major in medicine and minor in religion in school. <laughs> like, is there some way to be able to do this? But I felt my heart lift. That's how I discerned what it was that I felt like the Lord was calling me to do. What lifts your heart? What do you care about? Bridget Beekner once said this. He said, the place that God calls you is the place where your deep gladness and the world's deep hunger meet. The place where the Lord calls you is the place where your deep gladness, all the things that you love and you care about and you're passionate about, and the world's deep hunger meets. And then sometimes we can read a, a quote like this and it's incredibly inspirational, but that also can be a bit overwhelming, right? Like, what, the world? <laughs> the world's deep hunger? I don't know if I can identify what the world's deep hunger is. The world is a, de- is a big place. We can feel overwhelmed by something like that. We have to remember that the world starts right where we are. That the world is, yes, global, but it's also very local. The world is the place that we live, the place that we work, the place that we worship. It starts with our home and our neighbors and our church and our city. And what we're called to do is to see all those places of need, all those places that are not yet fully formed and functional, all those places where Genesis 1 hasn't taken its full effect to be going about our lives and asking the Spirit to reveal to us where those places of need are and to see what stirs our heart, what lifts our heart, what moves us, what we begin to care about. And then take all of those gifts and talents and abilities and resources and skills and experiences that the Spirit has given us and say, I'm going to co-create with God right here. As the band comes forward and the communion servers come, I want us to take a moment to pray today. So just wherever you are, if you want to just open up your hands. And maybe today you're in a place where you're like, I I just never have seen my life that way, my work that way, is anything that's spirit-filled. Would you take a moment and just begin to ask the Lord right now? Say, "Would would you change my vision? Would you help me to see my work the way that you see my Would you help me to see it as the way in which you, the Spirit of God, have filled me for co-creative vocation with you? Or maybe today you're facing an obstacle at work, something that you're coming up against that you you don't know what to do about. Would you take just a moment and ask the Spirit, would you show me? Would you give me what I need? Would you give me skill and wisdom and knowledge? Show us the very things that you uniquely made us for. Would you call us into that place? Help us to see it and call you. Would you fill us for that? Spirit of God, we want you to fill us in every way. We don't want you to just fill part of our life. Or fill us for um, just the things that we think. come to the table today, I was struck by the fact that on the night that he gave himself over to suffering and death, our Lord Jesus took bread, bread that had at some point been seed that had been sown in the ground by a farmer, harvested by people who used their hands, turned into bread by a baker. Jesus took the work of their hands. When he blessed it, he broke it, and he gave it. This is my body, which is given for you. The work of their hands became a symbol of the kingdom of God, the very life of Jesus. And after supper, he took a cup of wine, wine that at one point had been grapes that had been...
carefully cultivated and harvested and then turned into wine. By who? By people doing work. Poured into a cup. Where'd that cup come from? People who had made it. And then he gave to them, said, drink of this all of you. This is my blood of new covenant which is shed for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. And Jesus took the ordinary work of people and made it about something so much bigger and so much more and something more beautiful. And maybe as we come to the table today, we remember first and foremost the work of Jesus, the greatest work in the world. And second, then we ask Jesus, would you take our work, we place it in your hands, would you bless it, would you make it something more? Would you help it to speak of you and your kingdom in the world? Amen? All right, we're going to go ahead and come forward and receive the elements. If you exit on your left, return on your right. For those of you who are visiting, if you want to just grab the elements and hold them in your hand. After everybody has received their elements, then we're going to receive them together this morning. these are the gifts of God that have been given for us the people of God and so we receive them in remembrance of all that God has done for us and we feed on Jesus in our hearts by faith and with thanksgiving let's receive the body of Christ together this morning let's receive the blood of Christ this morning God for his work in your life, for his work in the world, and for the work that he's given you to do, the work that he's called you into, the ways in which God is relentlessly wanting to go about his work in the world by including us. It's always been his dream, not to do it all on his own, to include us in it. Say, come on, kids. Come get in on this with me. His work is the ultimate work. His work is the great work, but he includes us in. So come do this with me, son. Come do this with me, daughter. So let's give him thanks for everything that he's given us to do with him. Even that is a grace. It's a gift. It's an invitation. So we give him thanks this morning. We give him thanks in song singing or doxology this morning, praising God from whom every blessing comes from. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him, all creatures here below. Praise Him.
Sure, I always have that.